Hi, everyone, and welcome to Open Door Philosophy, a podcast where a high school philosophy teacher, that's me, and his former student who's currently studying philosophy in college, that's me, unpack a variety of big philosophical concepts in an understandable way, all towards the purpose of living a good life. Welcome to episode 16, the second of a four episode arc on ethics and morality, where we'll discuss this time the ethical system known as utilitarianism. But before we get to all that excitement, Andrew, how's life? Life is pretty good. I I think I've moved in since the last episode. I think it was my very last day at home last episode, so I've moved in. Things are going well. We had a little false COVID outbreak at Rice this past week, so we have to get tested every week, and some of the tests were, I guess, corrupted or something, so it so there was a bunch of positive cases, but they just turned out to be false. So that was exciting-ish, but I was lucky enough not to have one of those. But other than that, classes just picked up. I am taking a few classes, and I really like them so far. So that's been very fun. Yeah, what, what are you taking? So I'll, I'll pull up the list. I'm taking a, a classics, a basics classic course where we just are reading classic literature. The, I didn't have to take that one. It was just for fun. I'm taking Greek. I'm really excited about that course. I really like that. Um, I'm taking a course called Socrates. So I'm staying for, this is like two years in a, in a course just about Plato or Socrates. So it's been fun. And then I'm doing a directed study that I think I've mentioned one time before on Aristotle. So all super excited about that. How, how are you doing, Mr. Parsons? I, I think school's been in session for you for, is it almost a month now or two, two weeks? Well, not quite. I mean, as far as students, uh, we've been in session for two and a half weeks. We started on a Wednesday, but it's all going well. You know, the specter of the Delta variant looms over us all here in the great state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I mean... School's been school's been good. I'm really enjoying my classes this year and got a great great bunch of of young philosophers. And right now, well right now we uh, well we did Allegory of the Cave last week. Really? So that's a fun that's yeah, a yeah. fun one. So oh yeah. Did you f- refer them back to our second episode where we discussed that? Well, actually <laughs> actually I had two students who are going to be out uh, due to a tournament the two days that we were going over Allegory of the Cave. So I sent them the reading and <laughs> I was like, you know, you can't replace what happens in class, but if you want to hear me talk about it, <laughs> you can listen to our podcast. It's episode two. It's <laughs> a good way to get some. Which, by the way, is, is our most listened to episode. Oh, really? That's uh, awesome. Allegory of the Cave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But other than that, just put in, just put the, the finishing touches on a new shade garden in our backyard. Uh, it's about eh, 20 feet or so. So lots of lots of English ivy and ferns and caladiums. And it's just a part of our backyard that literally gets zero sun. <laughs> even, even in the summertime when the sun is at its northernmost point as it goes across the sky, it still gets no, no sun. So nothing grows there. We've tried to make grass grow there many, many times in the last seven years since we've lived here. And finally, just threw in the towel, and uh, was being a good stoic, <laughs> letting nature do what it wants to do, and accepting the conditions. So, we've tried to get grass to grow there, and it won't. So, we made a shade garden. <laughs> so, on our last episode, I, I think I went a little overboard on my books that I've been reading over the past few months. So, w- what have you been reading? Actually, before we get to that, I gotta know: Are, are you still are you still reading the Count of Monte Cristo? Ah, uh, yes, yes. So I, I left that book at home, but I got about halfway through. Still very, very good. I think I filled in a lot of parts that I I could tell a little things were missing, but I never put it together. But I got about halfway through, and so I'm really looking forward to the next time I'm going home to finish that one up. Well, good deal, good deal. Uh, yeah, the book I wanted to mention that I read over the summer that I, I mean, I read a number, but the one that really resonated with me was, and this this fits in very well with our 
recent episodes that we're doing. It's called Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times. And it's by Jonathan Sachs, who just passed away last year. So this really is his final work. And it's a, it's a really wonderful one that, that encapsulates really, I think, just the, the publishing project that he's had uh, during his career, especially in the last 20 to 30 years. He was chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, a position that's very similar to, like, say, the Archbishop of Canterbury, except for Jewish sect. Anyway, I, I've read a number of his books. Uh, the Dignity of Difference is another one of his that I've read. But this was his last one. And, you know, it, it cites a number of things that we would probably consider common concerns when it comes to, you know, divided times that we say that we live in. Things, you know, like social media and individualism and loneliness and, and those types of things. He, he also, in identifying all those things, has answers in how to make our times less divided. And that's what I appreciate about it. There's a lot of people who can identify the problems with our society in terms of how we interact with each other as human beings. But oftentimes it's lacking in the answers department. And so I feel like he does a good job of that. But I mean, really what it comes down to is creating a, a we versus I mentality in our cultures and societies. It's getting to know people. It's not isolating ourselves. It's he's Jewish. And so he uses a term that he outright you know, says he's using because he's Jewish. But the idea of covenant, obviously the Jewish relationship with God, especially in the Old Testament, you have a lot of covenant making. But he also talks about, you know, if you want to use marriage as an example, you know, marriage is a covenant between two people. And those two people, if they're married their entire lives, are going to go through phases in their lives when they don't necessarily see eye to eye on things. And so what's, what's the action that should be taken, you know, when that occurs? Well, in a covenant, you work together to try to solve that problem while at the same time continuing to honor, respect, and love each other. Whereas it seems like in our society these days, we build walls and demonize the other side and go down that rabbit hole. So anyway, it's a really great book. I totally recommend it to anyone who'd be interested and that kind of stuff. Again, it's Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times by Jonathan Sachs. All right, everyone, welcome to the main topic of our episode. Like we mentioned earlier, this is the second episode of a four-series arc on morality and ethics. And today we're going to be focusing on one of the most popular um, ethical systems called utilitarianism. But before we launch into big questions about utilitarianism, it seems quite necessary to understand what is utilitarianism or consequentialism. So Mr. Parsons, if someone came up to you and asked you, what is a utilitarian? How would you answer that? I'd probably start with saying that uh, we're all utilitarians on some level. (laughs) It's one of these ethical systems that I think a lot of people use without knowing that they're using it. It's a way to make decisions, of course, about moral issues. But the the bottom line, I guess, with utilitarianism is very simply that we should seek the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. That's how we should determine what is right and what's wrong when when it comes to decisions. And I think we use this pretty commonly uh, throughout throughout our daily lives. Certainly our government and republic is somewhat founded on this idea, the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. You mentioned consequentialism. It is also sometimes referred to that because the philosophy focuses more so on the consequences of the action rather than the intent of the action. So everyone will see how that how that plays out throughout this episode. But yeah, I don't know. Anything to add to that? The only thing I can think of is over the Over the years, there's been a lot of work on utilitarianism. I know we'll probably talk about Bentham and Mill, but there's a famous, I think, British philosopher from the 20th century named Karl, is it Karl Karl Popper? Is he British? I know Popper. I want to say he's British. 
I think I think he's British, British. but I know he. I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, n- no, he was. Oh wait, well he died in the United Kingdom, but he was born in Austria. Okay. Okay. It says here. Well, I guess he must be British. Sir Karl Popper was an Austrian British philosopher. <laughs> Well, do what you want to with that. <laughs> I'll claim the victory. Anyway, Karl Popper proposed a negative view of utilitarianism. It's not negative in the sense of bad. It's just he kind of flips the type of utilitarianism calculus around. So instead of the greatest pleasure for the greatest amount, it's the least amount of suffering for the greatest amount. I think utilitarianism, you, I think there's around eight main types, but they all share something in common. It's what Mr. Parsons said. It's maximizing something for the greatest amount of people. And something I often really like to think about utilitarianism is there's kind of a calculus at play behind it. You're trying to calculate how you can best do X for the greatest. Yeah, sometimes utilitarians take a knock for being too calculating. And we'll certainly get to that in the episode. And I guess, you know, here's our disclaimer for the episode. For someone who's really quite well versed in utilitarianism, this episode will probably seem very surface level. But we're hoping that for people who are unfamiliar with this idea, that uh, that it will be pretty relevatory. And, you know, in addition to, to Popper and other really famous, or I don't know, famous, but at least well-known utilitarianist is Peter Singer, the, the Australian philosopher. He's quite well-known, and, and we'll talk a bit near the end of the of the episode about his book, The Life You Can Save. But whether we're talking about alleviating suffering or whether we're talking about maximizing happiness, I mean, the, like you said, the, the bottom line is we're maximizing something for the greatest amount of people. You, you did mention that Bentham and Mill are kind of, uh, sorry, I should say Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill are what's considered the, the founders of utilitarianism. Do, do you have anything to say about them? So I think something important to understand about these two people before we preface any of their work is John Stuart Mill was a politician, I believe, or he he at least was a member of parliament. He was also very well versed in political philosophy. And I think that a lot of utilitarianism's appeal can be found in having to make choices for a large amount of people. So if you're governing a country or you're a, if you're a politician at all, it can seem very appealing because, you know, you're trying to maximize happiness. I think Aristotle says that the goal end of politics is to make your citizenry happy. And so if utilitarianism's aim is making the largest amount of people in your population happy, then it seems like that's the ult- ultimate system that you should follow for all your choices. Yeah, we get into some difficulty here with with that particular word, happiness, right? And, and I think we'll unpack that a bit as well. One of the things we need to remember about these philosophers too is, is the time period in which they wrote. Bentham came uh, before John Stuart Mill, but they were writing in the, Bentham was writing in the late 18th, early 19th century. And then John Stuart Mill after that, mostly throughout the 19th century. So in England, this was during the time of the Industrial Revolution, and the population of London was growing exponentially. And there were great concerns about, although there's always been concerns about how to structure society, with so many human beings moving into London, and then the problems that come with so many human beings in such a small area working for very low wages and really horrible conditions, there were a lot of questions about how to maximize happiness. And also something too about Bentham, he was a, I think the term is an ethical hedonist. And so it, it really makes sense for when you're looking at it through this way, where a hedonist is someone who thinks pleasure is the ultimate good. It also makes sense that Bentham is wanting to maximize pleasure the largest amount of people. If pleasure is the ultimate good too, in his eyes as a hedonist, then maximizing pleasure is bringing people closer to their ultimate happiness. Something interesting about the two was that 
Bentham was Mill's teacher or they worked together very closely. I think that's also quite interesting because it's kind of like this uh, mentor-mentee relationship and philosophy of utilitarianism is being stretched out into two generations where it can be unpacked. And I think that's something that we don't really see with a lot of other ethical philosophers. They certainly knew each other. Uh, Bentham's students included John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill. Okay. Um, Okay. So Bentham knew John Stuart Mill through that association. Yeah. So Bentham and Mill, if we were to summarize their, their outlook, and then we could probably begin talking about arguments for and against this particular system, Essentially, in their conception of it, and like we said, it does change throughout the 20th century to our current time, they were interested in in explaining ethical phenomena in terms of the principle of utility, right? So, So according to this principle, the only thing that is good in itself is happiness. And actions are right insofar as they tend to increase happiness and wrong insofar as they tend to decrease happiness. Now, the first thing we can very easily pick on is what is happiness and is that a goal in and of itself? But Bentham tells us that that it's the sum of pleasures, right? Uh, This is his explanation to, to what is happiness. Bentham said that happiness is the sum of pleasures and that a happy life is the one that maximizes feelings of pleasure and minimizes feelings of pain. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Jeremy Bentham wrote a book In that book, he proposed a system of calculating the classifications of pleasure and pain so that one might actually be able to calculate how happy one might actually be. And he calls this test the happiness factor. And you test an action to see how happy it will make you. Now, can do I think we could reliably do that? Probably not. But I think that it's certainly like a notable thing to do that Bentham was thinking that criticism that you raised that for this philosophy to be important and to work, we have to identify happiness. And if I'm correct, he also created, mm. you know, to apply this entirely to, to a society, what he called the gross national happiness and essentially applying that, essentially making decisions for large groups of, of, <laughs> of humans as long as the gross national happiness is greater than the gross Mm -hmm. national unhappiness, then we are living in a morally better world. I mean, there are a lot of criticisms with that for me. I get it. I mean, it's like, it is the exact opposite of the ends don't justify the means. The ends definitely justify the means. And there's some issues with that. And, you know, also when you're talking about just the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people, well, if it makes 52% of the people happy, what about the other 48? Those are just, just kind of off the top of my head, some, some criticisms outside of like, you know, can we truly define happiness with this particular system? But like I said, I think people generally use this, at least to, to a degree, in their own lives and making decisions about what to do with schools or organizations or businesses or you know, whatever, when it comes to like human resources decisions and stuff like that, you know, we, we appeal to like what is what we consider in whatever calculus we're using the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. Yeah. Or even what's going to bring us as an individual, the greatest amount of good for ourselves. Say that I'm going down the street, I'm passing a bunch of restaurants, fast food places, and I see a Taco Bell I see uh, Shipley's Donuts. I don't, I don't know if they have those in other parts of the country, but it's a famous um, donut chain in Texas. Oh, yeah. And then, um, <laughs> and then I see a fancy steakhouse. Say I'm looking at like all three of these restaurants and I say, okay, um, utilitarian Andrew, I'm going to see which one of these places I should eat at, which one is going to be the best for me. So I look at the Taco Bell and I, I make a decision based on if it's going to bring me the greatest amount of pleasure or happiness. We'll, we'll just stick with pleasure for now since we're, we've been talking about Bentham. So I say, oh, you know, I think Taco Bell, it's, it's really cheap. That's an important part of my calculation. But also, it, it's, it's also pretty tasty. I would 
maybe say it's like a six out of 10, but it, it makes me feel bad after I eat it. And then so then I compare that to my calculation for Shipley's. It's cheap, it's tasty, and I also don't feel good after I eat it. And I compare that to the steakhouse. It's not cheap at all. It is tasty, and I do feel good after I eat it. And so um, utilitarian Andrew and whatever his calculations would be would make his decision based on which one of those would give me a, a, the best outcome for my individual self. I don't think it necessarily has to be for like a community as a whole. And I think that's kind of what you were saying. Like, yeah, I, I don't think it would be strange to say that we make these decisions in our head, this calculus, whether we know it or not, every single day. I would say considering the intestinal distress after Taco <laughs> Bell is, is a very big consideration. <laughs> so what, what you've laid out for us here is, is really one of the arguments for utilitarianism. In a way, it's, it's very rational, right? We take an approach to whatever is before us, whatever choices are before us. We are reflective in our, our decision making. We consider our future selves in this decision. This is why it's also called consequentialism. In the moment, you may want Taco Bell because, and I hate to say it, sometimes it does taste good. Uh, <laughs> not a, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of flack for that. But, <laughs> but you know what? It's not good for you. It's nutritionally terrible. And <laughs> you will probably have <laughs> intestinal distress <laughs> later on. And so you're thinking about your future self. And this is why, again, this is why it's called consequentialism, because it is it takes you out of the moment, if you will, and you must consider your future self. We can use all kinds of examples for this, where we do this with ourselves. We put ourselves through temporary distress in order for a, a greater outcome. I mean, you currently are in college, and while there's a part of you that probably enjoys college, college is a lot of work, and you're doing it probably for your future self in a way, right? And so those are those are some of the good things that, or, or rather arguments for utilitarianism that's rational, encourages us to take into account short-term and long-term consequences of our actions. Before we get into some criticisms, let's, um, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but why don't we move over to the, the train tracks and, and look at utilitarianism <laughs> through the trolley problem? Ah, uh, the trolley problem. This is Andrew's favorite <laughs> thought experiment in all of philosophy. Of course, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell us about it. I'll just ex re explain the whole situation. So imagine you're standing above some train tracks on a podium where, where a conductor would usually stand. Is it a conductor? I don't, I don't know too much about trains, but train operator would stand and, and divert the tracks so it could move in whatever way it needed to go. And then say some a mischievous villain had tied up on the train track that was that the train was currently going on five people. So five people are directly in the path that this train is currently on. And then on the train track over, um, there's one person tied up to it. So on this track with one person, the train is not directly in the path. Now you're standing above watching this entire situation. And so you're looking at the, the track with the people. You see the lever that you could pull to make the train avoid the five people, but it would kill the one person. Now, Mr. Parsons, what would a utilitarian do in this situation? Oh, a utilitarian would pull the lever and have the trolley kill one person instead of five. Yep. I mean, that's a that's an easy calculation, right? Yep. You would say a utilitarian would say that greater happiness would result from that decision because five people are saved and their families and everyone that would be included in their circle and their lives would be relieved and thankful and happy versus the one person who unfortunately has to die their web of associations with people would be much smaller than, say, the, the five people and all of their friends and family. I mean, just it's simple calculation, right? You save, the, you save the five at the expense of the one. Now, what are some problems with that? I think this is not a very good problem, but this is... I never think a situation is 
probably going to be that simple. And maybe this is something I just have, I think that's inherently wrong with the trolley problem. But let me offer a, a kind of other situation that I think raises a, a problem with the utilitarian calculus. So say that there's five people on one track and then the one person on the other track is like someone you really love, like your mom, your dad, your sister, your wife, your your husband, whatever. So say that that person is on the other track. Say the people who are tied up, the five other people are like the worst people on earth. They're like rapists, criminals, murderers, whatever. So in this situation, we could change the one person you love to for, I don't know, someone who's really good, like the, the Pope or like Mother Teresa or whatever. It can still be someone you really love. I think utilitarian would be forced into saying, yeah, you know, we, we have to save the five criminals at the expense of one really good person or this one person that you really love. And I think that's a that 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 can that can raise a few eyebrows. What do you what do you think about that? Well, again, one of the one of the knocks that utilitarianism takes is that sometimes it doesn't always Mm -hmm. include and or doesn't take enough into account context in decisions. Now, if it's a personal decision, if this decision is made in a vacuum where there'd be no societal consequences for the person pulling the lever. Uh, you'd probably save the person that you that you love. Mm-hmm. Even if the other five people weren't terrible people, even if they were just people you don't know, you know, you have to, if, if the one person on the other track is, is your mother, you know. <laughs> oh, moral philosophy. <laughs> I mean, a- another thing to consider, of course, is if this, decision is not being made in a vacuum, if it does have societal consequences, what consequences might occur to the individual pulling the lever as far as judgment from society and their decision? I think another question that you have to ask is, what is the value of a human life and whether or not the types of people that the people are tied up to the tracks matter, whether or not they're criminals or they're just good folk? All of that just becomes very very complicated. And when you enter all that data into the calculus, if you will, it's just very hard to, to make that determination. And, and one of my criticisms about all of that is a majority of our moral decisions we make on a daily basis are decisions made very quickly in the moment. We don't have time to sit down and calculate and all of that kind of stuff with a decision like this, if we're talking about the trolley problem in real time, you might have 15 seconds to make this decision. So what would I do? Um, I'd save my mom. (laughs) Love you, mom. (laughs) I would too. A couple more arguments for utilitarianism is, is one, some people say it's just very simple. You know, if you take the trolley problem, yeah, you sacrifice one to save five. I mean, I guess on paper, that's simple. You're still killing a person, but, <laughs> but it's simple, right? Uh, the, the greatest, the greatest happiness, the greatest effect on the gross national happiness is, is easy. Some people will say it's democratic in a way in that each individual is considered the best judge of what makes them happy. So in a way it's a, uh, it's very democratic, I guess, from that particular perspective. Some people also say it's egalitarian, and this this will bring us eventually to Peter Singer and effective altruism. For example, it can redistribute money from the rich to the poor. So if you take into the account the consequences of particular action regarding this example here, if a dollar means more to a poor person than to a rich person, then a progressive taxation system of taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor would increase the gross national happiness. So from that perspective, I don't know if that's an argument for or against, depending on where you stand on all this. Those are some arguments for utilitarianism. And then a couple objections. We've already talked about these a little bit, but some of the practical objections to utilitarianism is like, you know, first of all, how do we measure happiness? What, what is the equation for that? 
And we do try to do that, especially through the discipline of economics, try to measure different pleasures according to how much people might pay for a particular product or something like that. But still, it's just very difficult to quantify happiness, especially given the great variety of, of people and experience. We might question that a constant stream of pleasures makes for a happy life. I mean, the more we, some people even say, like, the more we actively pursue happiness, the, the harder it is to find. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, let's put it this way. Do you make decisions in your life sometimes that don't necessarily make you happy? Yeah, I mean, I've never understood why people are such big fans of pleasure in the sense of wanting to maximize their own pleasure for the longest amount of time. And I think that if people really think about it, it doesn't really make that much sense. Maybe this is the bit of Stoics readings I've been doing lately, but think about something like, so imagine that you just, you're just like, okay, I want to make myself feel pleasurable as much as I can. Let's take this to the extreme. So every day after work, you really love this. Uh, um, you really love Shipley's Donuts, right? Or Taco Bell, one of these. So you stop there every day after work because for your entire life, all your same, all your goal is just to please yourself. And so you're always stopping there. You're always ordering. So you're never going to let yourself stop doing this, even if you have a little voice in the back of your head that's saying, oh, yeah, you know, like you're having to go to the bathroom a lot. You're having your stomach's hurting. It doesn't really matter because in that moment, you're wanting to please yourself. I don't know if that really makes sense. <laughs> I, I do think there's something to moderation. So let's take the donut example. It's well known for people who are familiar with me on a personal level that I have a sweet tooth. <laughs> if I'm at work and someone brings a box of donuts, I will have a very difficult time not eating three or four of them. I love sweets, <laughs> especially if they're fried dough with icing, right? That's not good for me. That's a pleasure <laughs> and I would enjoy it in the moment. I would enjoy the after effect, especially at my age, where gaining weight is very easy and losing it is not so, not so easy. So a constant stream of pleasures of donuts for me would definitely result in, in very bad consequences. But I mean, I guess with utilitarianism, again, you're supposed to consider the consequences. So I might try to have some self-control, but at the same time, like this is a, this is an argument against it, right? You have to define exactly what is happiness and what is pleasure and immediate pleasures versus long-term pleasures and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Like the long-term pleasure of not being overweight is a very different type of pleasure than enjoying a delicious, warm, soft <laughs> donut. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not thinking about what a actual living person who claims they're utilitarian would do. But instead, I'm thinking of someone who's like like a, a robot, perfect utilitarian. And I'm thinking that if it if it's like weighing every single action, it would seem like you would be succumbing to your pleasures a lot because the calculus, well, I'm not a perfect robot utilitarian. I'll give a little side tangent real quick. So when I was training for my T position, we had to come up with a pitch to sell. And basically, we had a list of two words. One was random and one was philosophy term. And so the person, who, the other TA in the class and I both landed on utilitarian unicorn. So I'm thinking, what would this perfect utilitarian unicorn calculate for their decisions? And I'm guessing that this utilitarian unicorn would be like, yeah, I, I you know, it's too difficult for me to calculate how that action's consequences would bring me pleasure in the future. And it seems like in the moment, this would give me a very high level of pleasure. So I should do X in this moment if it seems like it's going to give me pleasure because in the future, I can't calculate what its consequences might be other than giving me pleasure in the now. 
So I figure, you know, this utilitarian unicorn is going to be eating a lot of donuts. <laughs> That's good. Another criticism of utilitarianism is that sometimes the calculations are so difficult, so complex, mm -hmm. that it's impossible to really understand or know what consequences will result from it. And I think we can see this in our own lives as well. Again, you're at college and that's a four-year journey and you probably have some notion of what you want to do with your life afterwards, but mm -hmm. maybe you don't. But sometimes, you know, we wake up 15, 20 years later after we've graduated from college, you're like, I never thought I would be in the situation that I'm in currently, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. So just sometimes it's almost impossible, really, with the complexity of certain decisions to know what the consequences or what those decisions would result in. I think that I'm taking utilitarianism, not in the most practical sense, but what it actually would be if it was on paper. Because I think that's how we can best view these ethical systems and see which one is best or which one we should draw on from the most. But it seems like it would just be awful if we lived in a world that was totally utilitarian and we would be living in some really unethical times. Like, I think that if we truly did live in a utilitarian world, things like slavery would exist. We would enslave the other half of the population that wasn't in the majority. We would be just doing really awful things if they didn't seem like they would be benefiting society as a whole, causing pleasure to society, benefiting society. They would just be either treated awfully, killed, exploited, whatever. And so when we're looking at these ethical systems, it seems contradictory for an ethical system to be unethical. <laughs> Yeah, I think on the surface level, utilitarianism is very attractive as an ethical system. Yeah. But you're right. It can it can certainly go into some dark places because, again, and we will certainly get more into this on the next episode when we talk about deontology, which is duty ethics, the ends justify the means. So mm -hmm. if your particular group you know, wants to become the superior group, and you think that that is more beneficial for society than according to how utilitarianism works, whatever means you go through to, to accomplish that end is acceptable. And I don't think that's really the intention of, of, of people who advocate for utilitarianism, but you can certainly see where, where it can go that way. And that's, you know, that's the, emphasis or the focus on the consequences rather than the intention of the action itself. We can justify all kinds of things if it produces a particular end that we are satisfied with. Well, we've been talking about our, our buddies from the 18th and 19th century. Let's talk about, I guess, what we'll call modern day utilitarianism. And the person I really want to talk about is Peter Singer. He's quite prolific in the philosophical and ethical world. Many people might be familiar with him. He has a, a really influential book called The Life You Can Save. I've read it and I've taught it before. And it has some very compelling arguments. Just last week in The New European, which is a, a publication, uh, Nigel Warburton, the philosopher, wrote, a, a, a wrote an article on utilitarianism that dealt with an Olympian who decided to sell her medal to benefit the surgery of a person in an undeveloped country. And the surgery was going to be incredibly expensive, and, but however, would make a, a tremendous impact in this person's life. Well, from utilitarian aspect and what Peter Singer advocates for in his book, The Life You Can Save, what you need to do with your money, if you're going to sell your Olympic medal, what you need to do with your money is to consider where your money will make the greatest amount of impact for the greatest amount of people, to alleviate the greatest amount of suffering for the greatest amount of people. And an argument can certainly be made that something like vitamin A supplements for small children in undeveloped countries or malaria nets or, or important surgeries that you can impact far more lives with those types of services with your dollar than, say, one 
very expensive surgery for one person. This is a, for me, this is a pretty difficult argument in some ways, because again, you're not taking into context in his book, The Life You Can Save. And and I'm not saying I entirely disagree with this. It's important to alleviate as much suffering as possible for people. But, you know, Peter Singer would say that in your own country, say if you live in the United States, we would break down exactly how far a dollar can go to say, help provide food for the needy in your community. And then we take that same dollar and look at say Uganda and see how much the difference you can make with malaria inoculations in a person's lives and alleviate their suffering. That dollar would, would improve someone's life, many people's lives, far more than it would like the one person that you're providing a meal for in your community. And on paper, all that makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree totally that on paper it would make sense. I think that no one would actually act according to Singer's principles of doing this. Maybe not entirely out of motivation, just I think it just seems odd to us to do so. Not that we have a hard time doing it because we're weak or something. I think for an, uh, for another episode, we can more thoroughly delve into more criticisms. Yeah, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm representing the argument well. I mean, this is this is an argument from what people will call effective altruism. We want to be as, as effective as possible with our dollars. And I agree with that. Like, we should do that. It's just really hard for me to to say like, well, there's a there's a five year old literally right here in my city that needs life saving operation because she has leukemia or something. And that same amount of money could be given to a charity over in Malaysia, which would impact positively the lives of a thousand people. It, it's really hard to look at the, the little kid uh, sitting in a hospital with no hair that you know needs this life-saving surgery and say like, well, I got to pass on that because, you know, the most effective use of my dollars is to save the lives of these other individuals. I get the argument. It's a hard argument, but that's, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know what to do with that. I, I get the argument. It's a rational argument. And, and in my own life, just to like lay all the cards on the table, I do give to two organizations that are international organizations. I give to the Fistula Foundation, which provides fistula repair surgery for women in other countries. And I donate to the Helen Keller Foundation, which provides uh, vitamin supplements for young children in countries that typically don't get the vitamins they need through their nutrition. Uh, I I will never see those people, and and I will never uh, know that I've actually done good for anyone. But at the same time, I also donate monthly to the Houston Food Bank. And so like I try to split the difference, you know, <laughs> like, like the $30 a month I give to the Houston Food Bank, I know can go a lot further if I would just give that to like the Bellaria Foundation. So ethically, from an effective altruism perspective, I'm really torn on that. It, it's like it's like I feel like we, we should try to do the best we can for, for everyone. But I know that's probably not practical in a way. So clearly everyone can hear that I'm conflicted about a lot of this. So actually what I'd recommend you to do is to uh, to go pick up a copy of The Life You Can Save by Peter Singer and read the arguments. That's what we do in philosophy. Uh, and they're very compelling arguments. And it makes total sense to uh, give your money to an organization that will make the most effective use of your dollar. An alternative view, however, is like, you know, what do you consider contextually about your own situation in your own life, in your own community. And that's important too. But it's a wonderful book. I think you can get it for like 10 bucks if you want the paper copy. You can download it for free uh, on Kindle, which is very utilitarian of the publishing <laughs> company. Actually, actually, Peter Singer bought back the rights to the book um, so, really? so, that, so that he could offer it. Actually, it may be 99 cents on Kindle. Uh, (laughs) However, the audiobook is free and it's read by lots of famous people. Each chapter is read by, uh, by like Kristen Bell and I can't remember (laughs) who else, but, but a number, a number of people. Well, I think this is going to wrap it up for today's episode on utilitarianism. But before we end, as always, let's head over to the quote corner. (music) 
All right, everyone, welcome to the Quote Corner, a portion of our program where we take a philosophical quote and subject it to our scrutiny and then give it a very arbitrary rating on, on a scale of one to five stars. So this week, the quote comes from a person who wrote in to us, Brooklyn. She gives us the quote from someone named W.H. Furness, someone I'm not familiar with. That's F-U-R-N-E-S-S. But a very interesting quote. It says, every history is unconsciously and unavoidably a history of its author. Well, let me just uh, quickly thank Brooklyn for writing into the episode. On first glance, I'm not a big fan of this quote. Although I, at first, first glance, I was a big fan of it. At my first, first glance, I thought it was pretty good. But it reminded me of, there's this book that we read in high school called I think uh, a people's history of the United States by Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn, right? yeah. And there's some quote in there uh, that's like this. Like um, I don't know. I don't remember if it was a quote from the book or if just the teacher who we were using it with brought it up. Like the history is written by the winners. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I think this quote goes a little too far. First, I think that historians are very conscious about biases nowadays that they bring into the history that they're writing so much that I think there's a field devoted just to analyzing historians biases it's kind of odd but I could be wrong about that you're you're more of the historian than I am Mr. Parsons that's correct it's called historiography yeah and so I don't think that Every history is unconsciously that. Even even when you're thinking about like Herodotus or Thucydides, I think they, I mean, it's obviously biased in the Athenian and Greek perspectives, but they do recognize that, or at least one of them does, but I'm forgetting which. A history of its author, you know, that one seems more true to me. I think obviously you're going to get some information about the author inside of the historical work. Let me try to... Well, while while you go, as always, I will try to come up with our very precise rating. But what, what do you think? What, what do you think about it? Okay. Well, like you, uh, on the surface, at first glance, I I really like it. I always think that history is a product of its time, and in a way, a product of its author. You can also say the same of philosophy. All philosophers, of course, are impacted by the context in which they are writing. You can't talk about Nietzsche without talking about the impact of Darwin and and things such as that. But I will agree with you that historians today, certainly more so than ever as a discipline and as a practice, are more concerned about bias that they bring, their own personal bias that they bring to their works than than they ever have been before. Can you entirely alleviate bias? I, I don't know. You know, we were talking the other day in class, actually, about the difference between what we might call perspective and what we call bias. And is there a difference between perspective and bias? Everyone has a perspective, every historian, every philosopher, everyone who writes something. But I think, again, like you said, today, more people are aware of that, that are writing in in any of those fields. So I'm not sure when when this quote was, was written. So maybe if this quote was written in the 19th century. I can see it as probably a really insightful and maybe even progressive quote. Whereas, you know, if this was something someone said last week, they'd be like, "Uh, yeah, you know, sure. But also it's changed quite a lot. Well, as you said, just as history and philosophy is a product of its time, so is the inevitable quote corner rating. (laughs) So I think I'll start us. Ah, Yeah, sure. I'll start us off for today for Brooklyn's quote. I'm going to give it a 2.875 stars (laughs) out of five. Oh my gosh. (laughs) You're you're going the opposite direction. Now, how many points past the period was that? Three? 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 (laughs) I had to to be precise. You know, you really are just turning into a calculating utilitarian. <laughs> I was just about to say that. That was that's uh, that's that's uh, it's representative of the episode. I have my calculator here. Oh man, yeah. 
Well, you know, the fun of the quote corner is we have very little context for any of these quotes. So uh, so if I had context on when it was written, it might change my rating, of course. But uh, as it is, as it stands, uh, I will I will just got to give it a three. I think it's a very interesting perspective. I think it's a good thing to point out that, that you know, bias happens mm-hmm. in... <laughs> should make a t-shirt. Bias happens. <laughs> Bias happens in history, and, and, and we all know that. We need to be aware of it. But you know, in today's day and age, hmm, you know what? I'm going to backpedal on all of that. Maybe within disciplines of history and philosophy and science, maybe the people in those fields who are writing are aware of those issues. I wonder how much the layman person is aware of these issues in history. And so maybe that maybe that changes my perspective. I'm going to stick with the three stars, but maybe that changes my perspective a little bit. This quote might not be terribly insightful to someone who writes history, but maybe for someone who just reads history for the fun of it, you know, might not be as aware. So, yeah. All right, everyone, that's going to be it for today's episode on utilitarianism. Thank you so much for spending your time for calculating that it would be pleasurable for you to finish this episode. Oh, yeah, totally. We'd love it if you'd leave a positive review and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts so you know when new episodes drop. And if you all are wondering, we have run the numbers and it is ethically, morally (laughs) right for you to pass it on to your friends. The consequences are good. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to tell us what you think of the show, have a question you'd like us to discuss or philosophy quote you'd like us to rate. Thanks, Brooklyn, for today's quote. Please email us at opendoorphilosophy at gmail.com. You can follow all the philosophy on Twitter and Instagram and our website at opendoorphilosophy.com where you can find many things about the show, including our book lists and resources. Thank you so much to Kevin McLeod for the use of free music and the intro and the outro. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. And remember, when your life seems in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. 